People are still coming in, but we'll make a start. Welcome back to the, to the second session of the morning. Uh, so this, uh, this session is a mixed bag. We're going to hear about computing in hydrogen physics, uh, detector development, uh, future colliders, and um, education and outreach. Um, I see. I'd, I'd just like to also, uh, while I have this, uh, this spot, uh, to uh, congratulate the organizers and uh, for comfortable as I am. So uh, just a reminder for speakers, it's 25 plus 5 uh, minutes of questions and um, our first speaker is Richard Mount, will be talking about uh, computing in high energy physics. Okay, good morning, thank you to the organizers and thank you very much to all of you for, for being here. So I'm going to talk about computing in high energy physics and I have to make certain apologies like it's actually computing in experimental high energy physics and even more it's computing in offline experimental high energy physics. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a somewhat personalized view of computing in high energy physics because to get it all into the time available I've got to make a lot of restrictions and taking a personal view helps a lot. So I'll give you a, a personal view of many decades of computing. Then I'll look at what the next 10 years is likely to bring in terms of technology, what the implications will be for high energy physics. And then I'll look at high energy physics software, particularly focusing on scales and costs, both, both for event processing software and our grid software. And finally, looking at uh, one of the flavors of the current month, which is can we collaborate more effectively? So, my personal view of 40 years of computing, this sort of started before high energy physics in my life with a summer job at a computer services company in industrial Yorkshire. Uh, that was, is not the computer, but a, uh, one of the models of computers we were using. This was the input device, actually mechanical only, uh, punched cards. This was the network device, a uh, Ford van. And what I learned was, first I learned to program in COBOL fast and bad. Um, I learned fast and accurate card punching. When you, a single mistake means you have to throw away the card and start again, you get very accurate. Uh, and I learned driving up and down hills in a 38 horsepower uh, uh, van. So then I moved on and uh, got into real high energy physics as a graduate student. And I was fortunate enough to go to CERN and take some bubble chamber photographs in the two meter chamber. And they looked something like this. It's actually the wrong bubble chamber. Uh, we got hundreds of thousands of these, air freighted them to Cambridge, and then we had to pass them through a, a trigger because the trigger was open on the bubble chamber. Uh, that was human beings. And then through a data acquisition system, and it was a PDP-8S. And then through uh, offline analysis, and it was an IBM 36044, which was actually one of IBM's scientific machines of the time. Uh, the network was uh, three kilometers of bicycle ride, uh, and so generally overnight processing. Uh, and what I learned there was, firstly, astoundingly, if you're a bubble chamber shift person, you drink wine at lunch. Uh, Fortran, I learned Fortran, that was fun. Uh, I learned OS 360 JCL, that was really fun. Uh, I learned that people work better when you motivate them properly, uh, and if people are part of your process, that's really important. And I also learned that HEP involves a lot of arcane software, things called th like Thresh and Grind, big, uh, you know, huge programs already written. So life moves on, and I escape from the bubble chamber world and into the world of electronic experiments with huge data rates, uh, clearly much more capable in terms of physics, and I joined the EMC, European Muon Collaboration, and some interesting facts about this collaboration. It was huge, the biggest of the day, 99 physicists on the first papers, 10,000 tapes per year, a tape every 10 minutes after the data acquisition system. On the other hand, computing resource planning was a little strange. It was sort of hope we can process this data somewhere. Uh, as a result, it 
actually took two years to discover that some key parts of the detector were dying. There was so much background, you, they you record lots of hits, but until the reconstruction was done, you couldn't tell they weren't the hits you wanted. And this also led to us sitting on an important physics result for two years while we tried to kill it with detector sy systematics and finally failed. So what did I learn? Well, it might possibly be a good idea to plan for computing resources for the biggest experiment on the planet. Uh, I learned that data management matters. That was not just because of the 10,000 tapes, but also because one of the things I contributed to EMC was to propose a way to actually measure the luminosity of the muon beam. Uh, it wasn't called luminosity in those days. And that involved writing a lot of very small events on the tapes. And I was told immediately, oh, our data hand management system couldn't possibly handle that go away. So, of course, I had to write a data management system. And finally, I learned that software quality matters, uh, particularly if you shoehorn a lot of code into a, the small core memory on a 7600 by reusing variables all over the place, then even you can't understand it. So what did I really learn? I learned that software and computing matter. And in fact, that was a searing experience and probably led to a lot of the misdeeds that I've done in the rest of my life. Moving ahead to L3, as a picture of L3, it's now Alice, uh, same magnet. Uh, interesting facts, uh, now focusing on computing planning, Harvey, he's sitting in the front somewhere, and I planned L3 computing in 1983, about. Uh, we got the CPU too low by about a factor of 1,000. We didn't see any roll for disk because they were wildly expensive. Uh, all that was wrong, but our cost estimate was about right. We also connect, created the LEP3Net US CERN network that has grown today into the US CERN network that we now use. So what did I learn? Well, to quote General Eisenhower, plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Uh, that asking what our requirements are is actually the wrong question. Uh, what we should be asking is, what can affordable technology do for our physics productivity? That's the right question. You may not get the right answer when you ask it because you may not have the right information, but at least you know you're taking the right approach. And that in this context, technology includes CPU, disk and tape, and networks. Moving along, Babar experiment. Uh, so, interesting facts about Babar. Well, similar story about requirements. If I look back to the Babar TDR four years before the first collisions, asking for 17,000 MIPS, five terabytes of disk, and data movement exclusively on tape around the world. Reality, six years later, two years into the experiment, 100 times as much processing, 16 times as much disk, and never a tape got shipped anywhere. It all went over the network. Another interesting fact, we chose objectivity. I was involved in the choice in 1997 to handle all the Babar data. We magnificently scaled this technology up to about a petabyte of the period 99 to 2003. And then with much rejoicing, we threw it out and abandoned it. What did I learn? Well, the same things about planning and requirements as, as before. But I also learned that making strategic software decisions is really hard. You know, I agreed with the decision to go with objectivity. I agreed with the decision to throw it out. So let's go forward now and look at the next 10 years of technology evolution. And before I can really go forward, I have to look back. Uh, and before I ask you to look back, I should also ask you if you would like to trust my crystal ball or not. So I'll give you a few examples of how reliable I am. In 1986, at CERN School of Computing uh, Lectures, I said that the CDC 7600 is still a fast machine. Well, it was certainly an old machine, and it was still fast, but then I drew a conclusion from this that CPU evolution has stalled, and so got into parallel processing only 25 years too early. In 1990, two guys, Tim and Robert, came along and presented a weird system of distributed hypertext to me and a few of my friends. And I thought that L3 and the world could do just fine without it. And in 1996, I thought that the market for object database systems would be vast by 1998 and dominant by today and it turns out to be much the same as it was in 1996. So 
the message here is I've probably got all my mistakes out of the way so you can now trust me. So looking back at technology, uh, in the good old days it was very easy to predict. This is uh, 30 years or so of evolution of technologies that I actually bought or was very instrumental in buying. And over that period, you really could fit a straight line to the evolution of technology, how much you got for the dollar or Swiss franc. And prediction was just pro projecting that straight line forward. Worked very well. It worked all through the Bavar years. All the predictions were done on straight line ex extrapolations leading to exponential growth in capability. Some things weren't quite like that. This is transatlantic networking, and that's because it isn't technology dominated. It was dominated in those early years, the time down here, by the PTT cartels and the regulated environment. And even later on, it becomes dominated by the same sort of thing that affects the memory industry, that you get a, a, a lack of availability of memory in the marketplace, and then people start building fabrication plants that take a few years to come online and then you get a glut and so you get oscillations. Similar thing about pulling undersea cables. There are other things that uh, definitely don't look like this. This is a very interesting curve. It's the number of IO operations per second that you get from a disk per dollar. And this has been largely stagnant for many decades for obvious mechanical reasons. And I predicted 10 years ago that this would be really biting the LHC program by now, and that prediction was also not quite right, although we're in some difficulties with this. So forgetting that one, let's now go look and compare these technology curves with some other interesting curves. So here I have the data rate, the raw data rate of EMC divided by the number of PhD physicists. So in other words, data rate compared with the likely resources that you would get, because if you have a thousand physicists, you're likely to get more Swiss francs or dollars than if you have 10 physicists in your experiment. Here's Babar, also normalized the number of PhD physicists, and here's LHC program lumped together and roughly divided by the number of physicists. What you learn from this is that EMC was impossible, and I can confirm that, at least to the 99% level. The bar was quite difficult. Actually, the LHC is a walkover. Maybe. Of course, one of the problems we get is we actually have to combine thousands and thousands of these to make a whole system, and the problems of scale of the system are significant. OK, so now let's start to look forward. And here it becomes complicated because I've added the future data rates of the LHC as roughly expected, and I've added the future of CPU and networking and disk as I expect them, and I'll explain the ex expectations in a moment. So this is what that right-hand side line looks like blown up, and you can see immediately that I'm predicting we don't have much problem with CPU or network and I put tape on here as well, not really normalized, but at least the trend expected, we probably do have a problem with storage. This is the disk line. And I'll explain at least the sources of these guesses in a few moments. So here's the source of the guess for CPU. Uh, having been to Intel non-disclosures, of course, I turned to Wikipedia for my information. This is the tick-tock of die shrinking and feature size shrinking that Intel uh, expects to do. And this is the optimistic view, and this is the pessimistic view, and I've assumed that we go halfway in between, and that as Intel puts more, or anybody else puts more transistors on a, into a CPU, we continue to use them as badly as we do now, which is pretty badly, but we don't get any worse. Uh, for disk, again, another sort of uh, highly reliable source is the Register, a scurrilous UK-based uh, uh, IT magazine. And they talk about disk technology, and they say, if you want, do you want disk tech innovations? Fine, we've got them, lots of them. And that is how the disk industry is. There are many new approaches to recording on disks, all because we've run out of steam with the old approach, and no industry has not settled down on what direction to go, and they're in the doldrums as a result. Tapes, this is the tape industry consortium uh, prediction. It's optimistic. It's a factor of two every two years, and therefore I don't believe it, so I've uh, discounted this a little bit. And finally, networks. 
Very difficult to get good predictions for networks, but looking at the past, you have a 49% annual growth in demand. And as I said, evolution is all about market volume and the long lead time for undersea cables, not too much about technology. So my random guess is there. And putting those together, you get these factors. And taking the geometric mean of all factors, you get these curves. So what do they mean in terms of high energy physics? So firstly, the problem looks like it's going to be disk storage. And our options to deal with this problem is uh, an old-fashioned one, store less frequently needed data on tape, and more modern ones, recompute less frequently needed derived data, perhaps ideally uh, not even keep any copies of uh, derived data until they are needed, and move data rather than replicate it, or access it remotely rather than replicate. And if we could get all of this automated, we could have perhaps quite a decent time for runs three and run four of LHC. Uh, this would mean that we have to leave everything to the system and really only specify the integrity, just how much we want to keep data and how much we can tolerate losing it. Uh, perhaps the lifetime, but if we can actually get virtual data, being able to recreate data of which we have no copies, just exactly from the specification of how to create it, that would even get round that one. So, turning for the last 10 minutes to HEP software, uh, this is a complicated story too, so I've tried to simplify it by focusing on dollars or Swiss francs. Uh, firstly, before I get there, this is a very nice quote, at least to me, from David Williams from a 2005 academic training lectures at CERN, and I focus on the bottom. And the dates are slightly wrong, but it's largely true. So until mid-1980s, or perhaps the early running of the LHC, our computing problem was often thought to be about obtaining enough processing power. And then the LHC got data, and we worried about storage capacity. And the real problem has always been getting people to collaborate on the solution. Okay. So let's look at software scales and costs. And uh, a, a nice little tool, uh, olo.net, has uh, appeared to us. Actually, it was the root people who first put this onto their website. This allows you to analyze software projects and, among other things, get an estimated cost. So here is the estimated cost for root as we know it today. Uh, about $28 million, uh, that's based on what by US or CERN standards is a very low average cost of a, uh, a programmer. So in the US or CERN, I would multiply that by three to six to get a, a reasonable estimate. Uh, perhaps more reasonable is 501 person years. Uh, I tried this on a few other things. Uh, here it is tried on X root D, uh, saying it cost $2 million. Again, I think that's low. And here it is applied to Géant 4. Uh, that $32 million, again, I don't know if that's right, but I think the 590 person years is correct to better, better than the factor 2. Uh, of course, it's a fairly simple algorithm applied to the number of lines to, to calculate this. But this does seem to give us some idea of what we're talking about in terms of cost. So moving along. What do we think is the cost of the LHC offline software? Well, before that, let's look at Babar. That's nine and a half million lines of code. The formulae tell me it costs about $150 million. Probably not far wrong. LHC offline software, well, as one of my colleagues, Kaushik Day, said when I asked him earlier this week, you know, in your part of the Atlas software, uh, how many lines of code are there? millions, but I haven't really got a clue. So it's actually difficult to find how many lines of code there are in the LHC software, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars. And grid software, you, I'll comment about that in a moment. And I'm not including all the software p graduate students write to do their analysis. So going on, there's a fascinating story of grids I'd like to get to very quickly. Uh, I got into grids in 1998, making a proposal for 1999 funding called the Particle Physics Data Grid. This was along with my uh, co-collaborator in crime, Harvey Newman, once again, even though we're different places. And we were pushed somewhat to collaborate with computer scientists. And so this proposal has a lot of real computer scientists, where a real computer scientist is one who doesn't talk to a high energy physicist normally in a year. 
you know, the ones who actually talk to us have become uh, corrupted. Many of these computer scientists were actually talking to each other for the first time. Uh, we had an objective, which was to deliver an infrastructure for widely distributed analysis of particle physics data at multi-petabyte scales for thousands of physicists, and to accelerate the development of networks and middleware. So that was quite a nice uh, goal, and we were going to do all of this for $4 million. Fantastic. Now, even I'm not that stupid, even I tell lies, I did guess, simply based on the cost of Microsoft Windows, which was much simpler than what we were trying to do, that the cost was at least $300 million. Look at the timeline of these projects. Uh, PPDG rumbled along with various sources of funding for five years. Uh, and that was DOE funded, and we rapidly got the idea NSF should be in this game, and so the Grid Physics Network was founded in the US using NSF money, and that was clearly not enough, so another project, the International Virtual Data Grid Laboratory, was founded as well. And when those came to the end, we absorbed them into the Open Science Grid, which I describe as DevOps. It was mainly about applying the technologies with a lot of other projects hidden underneath that were doing further development. Of course, in Europe, uh, other projects got underway as well. And finally, what did this cost us? Well, it was much more than $100 million to date. But it, not only that, but it doesn't, when you take those things alone, it doesn't really deliver what the LHC program needed. So a lot of extra things were put on top of this, and this is just the number that fitted onto the slide as I was drawing the graphic. There are lots of other things. So a huge amount of software was developed, and the total cost of all of this is hundreds of millions. It's not $100 million. Clearly, there is quite a lot of duplicated and uncoordinated effort in this. Uh, it's significant, but that's with hindsight. It's not clear how much of the duplication was, was predictable and avoidable with foresight. In terms of the support for the LHC program, it's been a great success. I think uh, you know, I was surprised at the success, but it's been really great. In terms of the support for science in general, uh, or all of HEP, I think it's questionable. And the cost effectiveness of the whole thing, well, I annoy some of my colleagues by saying, I don't know, but I don't know. Uh, it's a very difficult analysis, and I do not know if I can claim this as being cost effective. So finally, a little talk about collaboration. Uh, it's been hinted at by the earlier things I talked about. Can we collaborate more effectively? Uh, well, we do collaborate quite well. This is GL4. You see uh, members from all over the globe, uh, and you see also outreach, successful outreach to NASA, to the European Space Organization, to medical and uh, other fields. Very great story for, uh, for our publicity. Uh, do we really know how to manage getting these things to happen? Well, we have success stories in meeting mission needs, like GL4 and ROOT, but what was the role of management here? Generally, not glorious. Uh, and in case of root management, tried to kill it for a long, long time. Uh, so mainly the answer is no. We really do not know how to manage these things in a top-down sense. We also have other issues in software. Uh, we don't know how to manage software life cycles. We know how to have great ideas, uh, get prototypes going, get something exciting and worthwhile. Then it goes into a maintenance and you know, many versions, and finally we have to give it a decent burial. Well, maintenance is tricky. It's not exactly career-enhancing, and decent burials are extremely rare, and our funding sources are well aware of this, and so they're rather, rather wary of starting anything in the way of a big software project. Looking at the LHC software challenges that we face, this is clearly that technology evolution will not meet our needs without a lot of software work, and we'd be better off collaborating on this. Looking at the non-LHC software challenges, these smaller but not necessarily small experiments and activities look hungrily at what they see as the rich LHC software and distributed computing environment, and they get very little benefit from it. Uh, we and the funding agencies need to fix this, or else we're going to be in real trouble. And finally, some, before I get to the final slides, some mountains that we have to climb, especially when we want to relate to the rest of the world, 
I've seen firsthand a perception that HEP in computing and many things goes around with hammers and insists that other people have nails, but the other people are not so sure. Uh, the perception uh, from some funding agency heads that HEP pretends to be collaborative, but is really after other sciences' money, that's widely held, and our internal distrust. You know, when I say collaborate, I mean do as I say. So, towards a more collaborative future for HEP software, where well, we've been trying to make an effort to see what might be the way forward, a foundation for HEP software. There was a meeting at CERN, April 2nd to 3rd, uh, where about 100 people were semi-randomly invited. And as a result, it was proposed we write some short five pages or less white papers on how a foundation to promote HEP software collaboration would work. And we've got a lot of white papers, uh, and you can read them all here if you want to. And a quick analysis, a very personal anal analysis, having read all of these, is that particularly after the meeting where there was some proposal of a classical top-down management for all of this, and it got a lot of virtual rotten fruit, fruit thrown at it, everybody favors a bottom-up organization. Uh, little disagreement that there's a whole range of support services with various priorities that a foundation should offer to HEP software collaboration. Organizational effort aspects are kept vague in all of the white papers because nobody wanted any more rotten fruit. And the challenge is therefore to identify trust-inspiring leadership because there's a lot of suspicion. Everybody knows that, for instance, the people who will volunteer to do anything in leading an HEP software collaboration are the people with time on their hands, and they're not the people we want to do it, are they? Example. So, finally, I come to my conclusion. Computing in high energy physics is vitally important. It's also extremely expensive. It's a very significant part of the cost of the science. It's still technologically challenging, and it's very definitely sociologically challenging, and yet it's fun. Thank you. Thanks, Richard, for a entertaining but provocative talk as usual. Are there questions for Richard? Um, Richard, it seems to me that uh, in terms of uh, high energy physics software, we are in a similar situation to the operating systems in the 80s. They were giant uh, uh, big boxes with many interrelated things that had to be developed together and could not be adapted to other things. And then actually Unix and Linux came, which actually faced the problem in a different way, making small elements with a very small core, but then everything was very uh, modular with, you know, you could build it up as a Lego block, as a Lego construction. Now, I think that my feeling is that we should move in that direction and make, you know, this uh, big software efforts much more separated in individual uh, uh, entities that can actually be developed by fewer people and not giant collaborations. What do you think about this? Well, I think it's, uh, it's clearly a second or n plus one generation approach to software because a lot of what we do is iterative. We try something and we see what's wrong with that and then we try something else. And obviously the very big monolithic software approach, uh, and I won't name any names for software that is like this, uh, this has some problems and breaking things down into smaller components with well-identified interfaces is just classical engineering. Now, of course, as soon as you do that, you enhance the communication problem between the whole community that is trying to do this. Uh, you may end up with a, a lot of duplicative, uncoordinated pieces that you can't put together. Uh, and if you try to put in place a rigid forward planning that produces components that fit together perfectly, then well, what you've got is a rigid forward planning. And that has not served software too well in the past. But I agree that there is a need, and that's where the Software Foundation can come in, to establish a framework in which we can do somewhat more modular and distributed software development and put this together into something that really works and serves high energy physics.
Avi. So I just wanted to make a comment that one frontier in the vast historical picture that you presented that was missing is after the grid systems were invented, there was a realization that global systems which are intelligent and self-aware would be the way to manage all this complexity. You sort of showed it in the reverse way of what actually happened by showing that the big infrastructures had to be supplemented by This is still the challenge. I think for the next round, such systems need to be developed. Such prototype systems and more have been developed are in operation, but people don't see them. Um, they work on the need to serve in the LHC program. But I think that if we're going to succeed for the high luminosity LHC, such globally distributed, intelligent, cooperative systems need to be built. So I certainly ac acknowledge your viewpoint, Harvey, and we have indeed had to create umbrella uh, software that has many of those properties in order to make the LHC program work. Uh, I'm also attracted uh, in, a, in a way that pulls my mind apart by the opposite approach is can we make systems that have very little global intelligence but sufficient local intelligence and sufficiently good architecture that they function marvelously like mainly the internet does. And uh, probably we're saying the same thing. No more questions? So let's uh, thank the speaker.